All right, hello everybody. So now we're taking moving into these final weeks. I want to just provide a broad overview of the Peruvian sociologist Anibal Quijano and the Argentinian philosopher, the late uh, Maria Lugones, on what I've titled from their works, The Coloniality of Power and the Coloniality of Gender. So as we've traced this concept of coloniality, and you've seen this before when we're thinking through Franz Fanon's work in um, the section on violence. So just to provide that definition again, coloniality is long-standing patterns of power that emerged as a result of colonialism, but that continue to define culture, labor, intersubjective relations, and knowledge production well beyond those limits of colonial administrations. Right? And it's central to this idea, which Nelson Maldonado Torres takes from taking from Anibal Quijano and from Maria Lugones is based on the idea of race, not the, the reality as real biological, but on the social political identities that race is fundamental. So that category of race, which we've read, once we shifted from the social contract theorist to the critique, namely from Mills, we see that this becomes central to establishing what he calls the racial contract. So Anibal Quijano, um, Passed away in 2018, a sociologist, a, a political theorist, and you see this chart here. It's a bit complex in Spanish, but the way we're thinking about coloniality, colonial, this colonial situation, and decoloniality um, here as we move to this section but thinking how it structures the world in all these areas. And I just provide this description so you can uh, take a glimpse and see how it structures every realm of life. So what you're reading in these few pages that I've assigned, I think eight, nine pages, um, it's just an introduction into one of the one of his works thinking about the uh, centering this notion of Eurocentrism. Where does that come from? And how does the modern slash colonial world become, become made? So we've traced the genealogy moving from the, the, the Greek thinkers, through the early modern thinkers, all premised and following a trajectory of Western political thought or Western political philosophy or Western philosophy in general. But what has been omitted, and as we, uh, until we started getting to the second part of class, was knowledges from other worlds outside of Europe proper. Right, so uh, outside of the continent, whether it's Asia, Africa, Latin America, and those spaces, and this is where Quijano, thinking from from a different context in Peru, is thinking about how the modern that era of modernity comes into being, and what we don't really see is that dark underside, the colonial world, right, and those knowledges that emerge from there have always been um, covered over or overlooked or removed altogether. So how this world becomes to be structured, what he deems right at the outset, this what we call globalization, is one of the fundamental axes of this model of power is the social classification of the world's populations around, again, that idea of race, a mental construction that expresses the basic experience of colonial domination and pervades more important dimensions of global power including its specific rationality, Eurocentrism. So what we're thinking here is not only as we're thinking about how race, racism, uh, the race, the individual racist uh, functions in the everyday, but it is that how race, this concept of race as a social political technology or idea about others structures the global labor hierarchy. Right? So racialized labor hierarchies are built from these ideas and premise, premised upon forms of knowing that elevate the superiority over one way of knowing over above all others. And that is rooted in this Eurocentric model, which is Western political thought. So what we've been exposed to here, and I hope that you've appreciated this, the varying ways of knowing uh, that emerge, remember that epistemology, what Charles Mills calls the, how white supremacy is premised on an epistemology of ignorance, meaning that those who have created the world are 
fail to even see the racist world that they've inscribed in every institutional aspect, right? So think of today when we're thinking today's discussions about uh, when people are polled on, uh, do you believe racism exists? Some people who experience it, yes, of course. Why are you asking such a dumb question? And those who don't, well, of course not. You know, it was banned and we have a civil rights act. Maybe it did happen, but it's gone. Um, so you have these ba two different worldviews, right? Parallel views of the world based on an epistemological foundation, which premise one way of knowing above all others. And this is where Anibal Quijano takes us to this idea of this framework, what he's calling the coloniality of power. The coloniality of power. And I place 1492 here because he places these moments of these two moments, the, the early modern period of 1492 and taking us to this period of modernity that we see later with the uh, subsequent American revolutions and therefore the rise of the Enlightenment period. And therefore, um, but what we have here, numbered here, is first you have the classification and reclassification of the planet's populations. So the concept of culture is key in classifying and reclassifying peoples. Two, you have the you build the infrastructure to articulate and manage these classifications. The university, the colleges, uh, churches, state institutions, and three, the definition of spaces appropriate to such goals. And four, for and and, and very important for us here as we move towards the end and hope one of the takeaways is that epistemological perspective. Remember epistemology is that field of the study of knowledge, how, how we know what we know. It's knowledge um, as it is produced, as it is articulated. So how this epistemological perspective from which to articulate the meaning and profile of a new matrix of power and from which the new production of knowledge could be channeled. So if we're thinking in a traditional political theory course, you would run the gamut of Western political thought only. We would walk away never being exposed to other ways of seeing the world, other philosophers, whether from Argentina, whether from Peru, Africa, Jamaica, Charles Mills, um, or Asia, or anywhere outside of Europe. Right? And you can be outside of Europe in those places that I name, but still be thinking from a perspective that privileges and elevates European ways of knowing. So that is the disciplines of that I just mentioned. Political science is one of those. Right? So, and this is all central and built around that idea. And I put the idea of race, I emphasize the idea because again, to to de-emphasize the reality, the beliefs before in this moment when the, you have the image of the conquistadores hitting the shores in, in Hispaniola and really having an idea of race, theorizing about the inferiority of the savages who inhabited the, the, uh, the colonial world or the Americas. So this all builds this notion or two sides of the same coin of modernity, coloniality as we're thinking about the development of history and the building of the world system. And these ideas are really centered about, right after that moment, you have some famous philosophical debates between the Spanish philosopher, Hines de Sepulveda, in 1550, who was thinking about a way, looking from Europe at the Americas, about the, the populations, about their classifications, about if they were human at all. And here, you have uh, Bartolomé de las Casas, who was seen as, um, who came to the New World and who was part of that colonizing project and seen as being a savior of the Indian. And I say that very loosely, but de las Casas on one side to, sim to simplify the argument for is he was a defender of the in indigenous and not driving them to death in the mines, not working them to death. He believed that although they were savages, that their souls could be saved so they could be almost human, right? Hines de Sepulva on the other side had a differing view. They did not fit into that epistemological or, or ontological uh, worldview of the human, which was the European. In contrast, they were savages and therefore they could be disposed of through their labor, 
Labor is always central to classifying this, to, to structuring the um, a racialized labor hierarchy. So, and here's an image, I just want to present this real quick, because when the Spaniards came, they began to classify and reclassify in what they called the Sistema de, de Castas, the um, caste system. And they had pictures of racial, they developed racial hierarchy and a typology of 52 classifications of racial groups. And of course, who was elevated to the top were um, those who descended from Europe or who were white from Madrid or what have you through Spain, who came to be known as uh, peninsulares in the New World, in the Americas. So the further intermixing one went, the, the more degraded the, the subhuman or subperson became to use Charles Mills's languages, language. So entered when we're thinking about how to classify labor, and this is a passage from Anibal Quijano, the fact that from the very beginning of colonization, Europeans associated non-paid or non-wage labor with those who were inferior, right? Thinking about, um, historically speaking, the vast genocide of the Indians was caused principally not by the violence of the conquest nor by the plagues, but because American Indians were used as disposable manual labor forced to work until death. So this goes back to the debates I was mentioning with De Las Casas and Sepulveda. De Las Casas, in, in that moment, won out. He stated that where they could be saved, we should stop killing them in the mines and, and extracting their, their value through the resources that were, were taken from the earth. And But one thing De Las Casas did mention, he said for that, we have we have the African, right? So again, we're not getting into that right now, but that was one of the contradictions in, in De Las Casas' view was the African was even further below the savagery of the Indian, right? So this again in the 1500s begins to open up, facilitate the dehumanization of the African to be disposed of in the Americas, in Brazil, in, in Mexico, in the United States. And this, as we took on for our purposes in this course, we're thinking through uh, John Locke on the Second Treaties of Government, which we've read. So John Locke, we know now, was an investor of the Royal Africa Company. We read in Charles Mills, um, was made made some very hefty profits off of importing those black bodies who had been dehumanized. So and to into the New World through the, as an investor. Right? And on the natives, he believed, of course, they, have, they are ignorant, they have no reason. Remember that epistemological perspective that is the Eurocentric form of knowing comes from that idea that it is a type of human that has that rationality. Um, and going back from, from that, you know, God gave the world to men in, co men in common, but it wasn't intended to stay that way. He gave it to those, the industrious and the rational. So the irrational or the savage, therefore, we rationalize their taking of their land, right? So the settler colonial state becomes to be, in the United States primarily, becomes to take shape through those ideas. And next we have Maria Lugones, which you're reading about the co coloniality of gender, who just recently passed away a few months ago. Um, this is one of her, her prominent texts, Theorizing Coalition coalitions against multiple oppressions. And she's thinking about, okay, Quijano, you've talked about the coloniality of power, but I'm bringing in these frameworks, again, thinking as a female, as somebody who identifies outside of that, that male world, while we're thinking about and using you know, gender and race and linking it to this model of po power that you've established that has built not only the modern colonial system of, of domination, but entered the gender. Right, so when we're thinking about gender, it becomes uh, becomes central to classifying classifying power. And again, she notes that labor is thoroughly racialized, and it's and what I want to move to is her added element of the concept of intersectionality. Right, so now things become very complex if we're thinking about it all. It is not so simple as classifying these binary opposition opposites of power and race being the only element in structuring capital accumulation, 
but it is all of these. And so think about for a moment how you encompass all these.